You understand the southern accent fine? Okay, thank you. Look, I'm here today and I'm angry. I'm upset and I'm angry because I know there's a representative of the Southern Poverty Law Centre here today and I want to send a message. I have worked hard for four years and I am not on your list. <laughs> Do you realise how hurt I am? You know, you've got Frank Gaffney here. Now, he's a good man, but he's more of a hater than I am. You know? Karen Sigamund. Karen Sigamund, the loveliest, kindest person you've ever known, and she's more of a hater than me. How do you think that makes me feel, people? Like, I was down in um, Temecula, and they have an Act for America chapter down there, and I spoke to them. And they had been specifically, as a chapter, put on the SPLC list. Not the whole organisation, their chapter. And I had to talk to these people and congratulate them for that honour. But I felt like in high school, you know, when, when you know, you're really interested in this girl and your best mate takes her out on a date and they start going out. And you have to say, wow, I'm really happy for you guys. I'm sure you'll be really good together. <laughs> You feel that the anguish I felt within when I had to say that. I was down in Iowa for a whole year doing a movie exposing the Muslim Brotherhood and Keith Ellison and Andre Carson and I worked hard and I walked with did events all across that state telling the people of Iowa about the dangers and the SPLC ignored all of that and they picked on the Amarna colonies about 50 miles away and put them on the list because somebody had allegedly held a little meeting there in a cafe sometime. This is discrimination, people. <laughs> and it's not on. It is not on, it is not fair, and I'm upset. And I want that communicated right through to the top levels, to Morris, to Potok and all those guys, even to Morris Dees. I want them to know that this is not acceptable. So please bear with me, I'm a, I am upset. Now, talk a little bit about the SPLC, the Southern Poverty Law Centre. Now, in the old days, it used to go after the Klan back in the 70s, and you could sort of understand that because the Klan was a very big problem, particularly in the South. But today, it goes after anybody who opposes the left. The SPLC is not an unbiased organisation. It is a far-left pressure group. It has people on its board like James Rucker, who cut their teeth in the Maoist movement at Stanford University, who worked with Van Jones. One of the main founders was a man called, um, and I've just forgotten his name now, a, a, a leader of the... A leader of the, um, the Democratic Socialists of America, a Marxist group. One of their main lawyers now is a woman called Eunice Cho, who was a member of the Korea Support Committee, a pro-North Korean outfit. You've got a lawyer working for the SPLC who supports North Korea. You cannot do that and tell me you really stand for freedom of speech or stand against hatred. And we come back to that old canard, hate speech, hate crimes. Where are hate crimes or hate speech mentioned in the Constitution, people? There is no mention whatsoever because your founding fathers committed hate speech quite a lot regarding King George, did they not? And had the SPLC been around then and tried to shut down your founding fathers, which I'm sure they would have tried to do so, you never would have had a revolution, right? What does free speech mean if you cannot call people out? What does free speech mean if you cannot name names and say what is bad and what is evil? What do you think the SPLC would have done to Winston Churchill in the 1930s when he was calling out Adolf Hitler? Was that not the right and moral thing to do, to call out evil when it appears? You tell me calling out evil 
is not an act of hate. It is an act of love. Because if evil is not named and called out, evil grows. It destroys people. It destroys society. It destroys lives. Evil must always be nipped in the bud. And you cannot do that when there are any constraints on free speech. Free speech means nothing, means nothing at all if it cannot ever be offensive, if it cannot ever be aggressive or challenging or somebody might take offence to it. Free speech must mean exactly that. And the whole hate crimes and hate speech narrative came out of the Maoist movement of the 1980s. They invented it. American Maoists event, invented this. It started with the Vincent Chin case in 1982 when an Asian man was beaten to death in Michigan and the Maoists seized upon this and it was a horrible crime to be sure. Was, I'm not defending it, but they seized on that and made a political thing out of it and all of these groups around the country got hate speech laws introduced into state legislatures and, and spread it right through the country. Hate speech is a Maoist concept, completely. It is completely antithetical to the United States Constitution. It has nothing to do with the First Amendment whatsoever. Their latest narrative is that the First, that, that the First Amendment does not, co does not cover hate speech because hate speech is an incitement to violence. And there are legitimate laws against incitement to violence. But calling somebody out as a terrorist, calling someone out as a subverter, calling someone out as anti-American or trying to destroy American ways of life, that's not an incitement to violence. That is telling very necessary truths. The Republic cannot survive if those truths are not told. So why do we have this massive assault on freedom of speech now? You know, who has seen the level of vitriol and contempt and hatred directed at a president in their lifetime? Even against Reagan or Bush, it was never this bad. But now you have it from the media, from the left, from Hollywood, from elements of Hollywood, the, the president, you know, even the president's wife, her choice of shoes is an object of contempt. You know, nothing is beyond bounds. So why are the left so absolutely hell-bent on shutting down this president, anybody who supports him, anyone who supports his agenda, and indeed conservatives and, and free, you know, freedom lovers in general? Well, the left thought they had it in the bag in the last election, folks. The whole media was telling them that Hillary had to win. It was inevitable that there was no way Trump could win. It was absolutely a foregone conclusion. And on election night, and I'll just digress a little. On election night, who remembers about two o'clock in the morning panning around the Democratic Party headquarters? And all those snowflakes were bawling their eyes out and crying and carrying on. Well, think about this, people. The Germans have a great work phrase. It's schadenfreude, taking pleasure in others' pain. Now, it's not a very noble thing, is it? It's not a very great thing. But did you feel a touch of schadenfreude that night? And after eight years of Obama trash in your country, don't you think you deserved it? Yes. So on election night, and who believes there's a touch of the miraculous about election night, right? I think even the most militant atheists would have to acknowledge that one. So there was a touch of the miraculous. But this is what happened. The left thought they had it in the bag. It was all over by the shouting. And on election night, they were so pumped up because they knew they had the one-party state within their grasp. And I'll explain why they had that. 
Hillary Clinton was going to do two things had she become president. One was she promised to legalise every illegal immigrant in the country within 100 days of taking office and give them citizenship and voting rights. Now that is between 12 and 30 million people. And what do you think they were going to, who do you think they were going to vote for, people? 80% at least. That would have given the Democrats between 10 and 24 million new voters. How do you compete with that, folks? Mitt Romney lost by 2.5 million. Donald Trump won by about 200,000. You give the Democrats 10 to 24 million votes, that was the end. And they knew that. The other thing she was going to do was basically enact House um, UN Resolution 1618, I think it's called, which would have basically made it illegal in this country to criticise Islam. Illegal. How do you fight a war if you can't name your enemy? Imagine what that would have done. Those two measures alone would have basically taken this country from our grasp. So they were so excited. They were so pumped. And on election night, they were like a bunch of kids who thought they were going to get the biggest bike you've ever seen for Christmas. And they got a pair of socks, folks. <laughs> and they are angry. And they are super angry because they know they believe their own BS. And they know that our alternative media, our Breitbarts, our Glenn Becks, our, all our alternative media, the, the Twitter, the, new, the Facebook and Fox News, they know that those things mobilised enough people to take away the election they thought they owned. And that is why they are attacking all of those media right now. That's why they're skewing Facebook. That's why they're skewing um, Twitter. That's why they're trying to shut down Fox News. That's why they're the Antifa are on the streets. The Antifa is the military wing of the Democratic Party people. And they are trying to shut down conservatives, free speech advocates, everywhere they can. Because they understand that this aberration that they think can never be allowed to happen again. So they are going to do everything they can to shut down free speech in this country. Karen had it dead right. When our ideas are put up against their ideas, there's no contest. No contest at all. So they're going to make damn sure that our ideas are shut out of the public square. Do you see this happening around you now? Yes. Have you ever been more afraid for your First Amendment than you've been in the last few months? Would you ever have thought of a time... Look, I went to Missoula to speak in Montana. They had to go through six venues before they could get someone who would host me. Because I am a known bigot, by the way, so, you know. They had to, I was talking to a friend in, in Arizona. He had to go through 60 venues before someone would host him. Because the local Antifa, the communists, the radicals, are phoning all of these venues and threatening them with violence if they dare to host anybody. So this is what is going on all over the country right now. This is driven by the SPLC. This is driven by the Antifa. But most of all, it's driven by the communist-controlled Democratic Party. They are the ones leading this charge, folks, and we should never forget that. Because they know that if this president is successful, that if he can... You know, like, like in the la before the last election, you know, President Trump would go out to Ohio and, and, and Michigan. He'd say, I don't see a lot of factories here, guys. I don't see a lot of wealth. Is this what the Democrats have done for you? And they said, hell yeah, you know, maybe we, we should switch. He went to the black communities, because the Democrats think if you're black, you've got to be a Democrat, right? So he went to them and said, I don't see a lot of progress in your cities. I see a lot of unemployment. I see a lot of drugs and crime. Vote for me, guys. What do you got to lose? And they did. So they are, the left understands this. 
If this president is successful and stops the Islamic refugee resettlement, closes the border to illegal immigration, if he can get on top of the crime and the drugs in the inner cities, and the only reason you have a heroin epidemic in this country right now is because the borders have been kept open so long to import more Democrats. So you've, if the president can bring back the jobs, bring, revitalise the Rust Belt, he, they know that their base, a chunk of their base, is going to permanently cross over. They know that there's going to be a realignment in US politics like we haven't seen since the Reagan era. And they know if that happens and the money starts flooding back into this country and the economy takes off, you think of all the money that's going to come in if the taxes go down, the regulations go down, you open up the energy fields. That is going to put the Democrats and their communist allies out of power for 50 years. That is why they are freaking. They had, were this close to the one-party state. They were this far away. They could taste it. They could feel it. And you people took that away from them. Well, they know... So their only option is to shut you up by any means necessary. That is why they are attacking you on Twitter and Facebook, closing down your accounts, demonetizing your YouTube like they did to Jamie Glazov. That is why the massive assault is occurring on your freedom of speech. And that is why right now, my friend Jimmy from Brooklyn always phones, phones me. That is why... That is why this conference is addressing, as Karen Siegerman said, the most important issue we are facing today. We have to save the First Amendment. We have no option about that. We have to give it everything we've got. And I salute the people in this room, like Lindsay Grathwell over here and Ben, who have put their bodies on the line for this, folks. Lindsay is the daughter of Larry Grathwold, a famous guy who infiltrated the Weather Underground, who used to know Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dawn, who was involved in those terrorist groups and exposed them to the FBI. Well, she's out there in the streets of San Francisco right now, behind enemy lines, putting her body on the line and carrying on that tradition. There are people in this room who have done everything they can to preserve our freedom of speech, and I give you full homage, folks. Um. So I just want to say, I come from a country that was saved by your country in World War II. If it hadn't been for your troops, your, your fathers and uncles and cousins, and at the battles of Guadalcanal and the Coral Sea and Midway, we would have been done, people. We all understand, anybody from the West understands that if we are going to survive, America has to survive. <laughs> Last thing. People, I can't promise you much, but I can promise you two things. If you do nothing over the next couple of years, your children will wind up living in slavery. But if you give it everything you've got, people, for what you believe in, for your constitution, for your country, the least I can promise you, even if we fail in this great endeavour of saving this country, the least I can promise you is that you will earn the right to look your children in the eye and say, I did everything I possibly could. Is that worth fighting for? And if you win, if you restore your constitution and especially your first and second amendments, if you can bring back your economy and bring America back to its rightful role, role as the leader of the free world, if you can do that, you will inspire liberty movements all over this planet, folks. Brexit will just be the first step. 
You will spark a liberty revolution like you've never seen, an economic boom like you've never seen, and you will give your children not just the amazing country that you inherited, but one even greater. Is that worth fighting for? So thank you all very much. God bless Americans. God bless everything about this country. God bless the Constitution and God bless you all. Thank you.